Hello everyone, I'm Karishma Galani from the R&D department here at ASB, and I'm here to introduce our last speaker for today, Sukriti Gupta, co-founder of the Academy for Earth Sustainability. AES helps schools, businesses, and individuals gain hands-on experience through sustainability. Holding a degree in sustainable design and fine arts from George Washington University and an ASB alum, Sukriti will be discussing about the, about the effects of the nature in building, in human fascination in building nature in today's world. Please welcome Sukriti Gupta. Hi, everybody. I know some of you. It's nice to see you again. Thank you for having me. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about nature and how nature helped me find my voice and the journey that we've had together. Um, so before we get into that, though, a little bit looking at history. You know, it provides lots of answers, like Dr. Rachel said. Since humans have worked with tools, we've always been determined to sculpt and build our landscape. In our ancestors, you know, with the gardens of Versailles in France, to the pyramids of Giza, to the temples in South India, we have done a fascinating and amazing job at, you know, building beautiful things. I'm often left in awe of all the things our ancestors were able to do using rather primitive tools, you know, things like the pyramids. And today, our world looks a little bit like this. We're able to literally move mountains. We can sculpt dams, move waterways, we touch the sky, we forge metals, we manipulate the whole world according to how we want it. And that is an impressive thing for a species. We're the only one to be able to do it in the way that we have. But there are a couple of things that worry me looking at the way life is today. Um, unfortunately, a lot of our world looks like this. All of these images are from India, and you guys see it every day on your way to school, on your way home. You know, our natural world is polluted, and at the same time, unfortunately, we have a number of global problems that we haven't been able to fix. We have poverty, we have malnourishment, and a lot of us are, you know, there's a lot of illness, mentally, physically, emotionally, kids are getting sick, adults are getting sick, all of these things are contributing to a life that, you know, isn't as great, and it's not perhaps the best that we can do. And what I, what, you know, what really fascinates me is the correlation between, or the connection between the natural world and ourselves. And, you know, the idea of is the natural world suffering, how does that affect us as humanity? Because we are so interlinked. And the other thing that really fascinates me is that no matter what we throw at nature, she survives. She endures and she finds a way to come about. Um, you know, you see it all the time trees coming out of concrete, your waterways, your animals that survive in an ocean that is depleted, things that have, um, you know, we, we waste, we throw a lot of our waste into our oceans, and yet this, all the creatures survive. How is she able to do that? And that's what I really want to talk about, some of the principles in nature that have allowed her to survive and things that we can maybe apply to our own lives. Um, in nature, there is, or rather, in... In my journey, when I was discovering nature, I came across something called permaculture. And permaculture is a system of ethical, ecological design. That's a lot of big, jargony words, so I'm going to break it down for you. What it is is basically a system of design, kind of like landscape design or interior design or architecture, that focuses on creating living systems that can help sustain life. So, and it's a global movement. It sprung up all over the world, as you can see from the diagram above, and it's something that was invented in the 1960s. Um, that has since taken shape globally, and it's something that was derived from close observation of nature. So it takes the principles of nature and turns them into principles for design. Examples of what a permaculture site looks like. Some of you have been to our sites around Mumbai, so you kind of have an idea. But as you can see from this slide, it sort of comprises of things like food systems, creating food systems, local food systems, water management, doing things like rainwater harvesting, drip irrigation to make sure that we use the least amount of water, we're able to conserve water, things like creating butterfly gardens or biodiversity zones to be able to enhance life, things like creating waste management systems, using recycling 
systems, reducing our consumption, reusing our things, to be able to reduce the amount of waste we have on the Earth. And essentially what we're doing is we're taking into consideration all the stakeholders of the planet. The people, the animals, the insects, the plants, everything to make sure that we all can thrive together. And in permaculture, there are these 12 principles. And I want to go through five of them with you that have really helped me as a person, that have helped different companies, societies, things that I see happening that are based around these principles. And the first one I really want to talk to you about is use and value diversity. So what that means in permaculture is basically, or in nature, is diversity of species. So when farmers are planting crops, they prefer to plant many different types of seeds of the same vegetable so that if anything happens, if there's a disease or if there's a pest attack, it'll only attack part of the, the seeds that are um, vulnerable to that attack. So instead of losing 100% of their harvest, they maybe will lose 50 or 60%. Human reproduction works on the same concept of diversifying our genes so that we become stronger. So in nature, that's how it works. And a little story about me, when I was little, I used to do a million things. I used to jump from hobby to hobby to hobby. My aunt used this saying to describe me, and I still remember it, even though I was five or eight years old. And um, she said, oh, you're like a jack of all trades, but master of none. And I'm not sure if many of you have heard it, but it's usually a negative thing. It's like you're never going to stick to anything, you'll never really learn anything, and you'll never really excel in anything. And this actually stuck with me for a very long time. I still think about it today, 20 years later. And the thing that I've come to realize is in that doing... And, you know, I went to college and I did the same thing. I went thinking, yeah, I'm going to do law, I'm going to become a great lawyer, I want to change the world, similar to what Dr. Rachel said, and I'm going to do it through defending people who have been, you know, abused by society. And I ended up doing an arts and design degree, which was way out there, very different from what I had intended to do, and in between, I even did a bunch of business management courses. So the whole thing was like a smorgasbord of many different ideas, and, you know, and that, again, when I got out of college, it kind of worried me. I went into doing this great job at a hospitality design firm, designing big hotels, but again, I wasn't really sure where I was going or what I was doing. And the thing about diversity is that finally, I realized in getting to where I am today, it was that diversity, those experiences, those hobbies, those college experiences, having different jobs, that allowed me to build my own company and stand where I am in front of you today, talking to all of you. You know, I've had a number of different jobs. I've worked as an artist, a gender activist, a financial accountant, a hospitality manager, a designer, permaculturist, an organic farmer. I've done lots of different things. And I've managed to somehow grab from all of those experiences and build something out of it. And so it's the same thing that I think will apply to you guys in your lives. When you are in school and you have lots of different teachers, they have lots of different ways of teaching you, those different experiences, that variety of thought, allows you to sort of take and choose, pick and choose what applies to you best. In the same way that you have lots of different friends, you know, it'd be pretty boring to have the same friend again and again and again. It's the same thing. Those variety of interactions really will help enhance you, uh, help enhance your life. And so that's kind of the idea that I'm going with here. And it's the same thing that applied to businesses. Many corporations are looking at hiring lots of different people to create lots of different products so that they can, you know, have a bigger customer base and therefore have more of a successful company. So that's really the first one. The second one, the second principle that I'd like to talk to you is designing from pattern to detail. So the quote underneath here is, can't see the forest for the trees. And so what that basically means is really paying attention to some of the patterns that we create that we um, fall into to be able to see what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. And to emphasize that, I'd like to talk to you about, I'd like to share a story with you about one of our sites. Again, some of you have been here. It's our orphanage in Thane. And when we started, it really looked like this. It looks quite different now, but it was, you know, run down, dilapidated. And there are about 70 boys living at this orphanage. And they had a host of different problems. They were malnourished. They had run down architect, uh, infrastructure. The roofs were leaking. 
The place was completely torn apart. There was no social infrastructure. They used to struggle. They used to fight a lot. There were a whole bunch of problems. And what we ended up doing, my co-founders and I, we realized that, okay, here's a really great niche society that we could experiment with, and we could see different types of ways to use permaculture to make their lives better. And so we started to build, we did trash pickups, we did a whole bunch of things. We built composting systems, we built water management systems, we built food gardens. Our main goal was to help their, uh, solve their malnutrition somehow, make them healthier, and to clean up the space because it was filthy. And you know, we'd come in, we'd come in about once or twice a week, and we'd do the workshop, the kids would be super motivated, 70 boys, so it's a lot of energy to handle, and they would like, you know, clean it up, promise to take care of the site, everything was great, lots of love, and then we'd leave, and then three days later, the whole thing would fall apart. The food gardens would be destroyed, there would be piles of trash everywhere. After a while, they just started dumping it over their, over their border, thinking that we wouldn't see it, but obviously, eventually, we did. And, you know, we really were wondering, what is going on here? You know, they seem very motivated when we're here, but when we're not here, the whole thing falls apart. And we observed a detail. We saw that Actually, what happens in the orphanage is that they get a lot of donations, a lot of stuff in kind, things like books, toys, um, clothing, but not, nothing lasts. In about two months, it's all destroyed. I once saw like, a really nice carom board be split up into about eight pieces in the span of three weeks. And, you know, fair enough, you have 70 boys living in one roof. Boys will be boys. The mortality rate of things is going to be pretty low. But the point is, is that we saw a pattern. We realized that there was no accountability. And so what we had to do is create a system of social accountability. And today, our site looks a bit like this. We have lots of functioning systems. We have a functioning food system. We have a functioning waste management system. The boys finally know where to throw their, their trash. Um, they know how to take care of the garden. They know how to feed themselves. They know we have a medicinal garden. They know which plants to go to for what, when they are unwell, when they cut themselves, and so on. And what we did to achieve that was we created, again, that system of social accountability. We created teams or houses, and we created um, a point system and a reward system to make sure that they did what they had to do for their benefit. And there was a sort of community gamesmanship around sustainability. And so what we did was we replaced one pattern with another. And that was a big learning for us, and without that, we probably wouldn't be able to have the site that we have today. And so, you know, that's great. So we've gone through two of the principles. One is designing from pattern to detail. The other is um, use and valuing diversity. But what about the stuff that no one can predict? What about the stuff that crops up that, you, that is unforeseen? Oh, well that nature has a solution for that as well. And um, one of the solutions for that, which I'm going to skip to, is creatively use and respond to change. And that is something that sounds very obvious, but it's something that we don't do very well. There's a saying that humans are very adverse to change, and we don't really like it, actually. But if we're able to embrace it, we are, you know, we make things easier on ourselves, and nature does that all the time. So again, the pictures of nature surviving. The picture on your left-hand side is actually of Chernobyl, where there was a huge radiation leak, and people again said that for 75 years, nothing would grow and the Earth would be barren. It's of an abandoned amusement park. And what ended up happening, actually, is that nature found its way. The picture on your right of the tree roots is actually in a city. I think it's a Hong Kong. And the tree has actually managed to take the shape of the tiles to grow, to find its path. And, you know, nature does that automatically, but for us, what we need to do is be able to be conscious of the change that is needed to make our lives better. And so, again, I'm going to tell you one more story about my life. And um, in December of, or September of 2011, I was diagnosed with potentially cancerous tumors. And the doctor told me that at this stage, there was nothing really I could do about it except wait and watch, and maybe cancer would develop, and maybe it wouldn't develop. And I would just have to sit there and lay back. And that's not very... I don't really like to sit back and sort of see what happens. And sometimes that works in my favor, and sometimes it doesn't. But in this case, it really helped me out, because what I did was I decided to look at my life and see, OK, what is going on? I was working at a top three design firm. I was working long hours, 18, 20 hours... Well, yeah, 18 hours a day. How can I change my life? 
and I decided, or I, and I decided to do some research on alternative remedies for cancer to see, okay, fine, if I'm going to get sick, I might as well get ahead of the game. And I started to read a lot about organic food and vegetarianism and how changes in diet, removing sugars, starches, all these things could really impact my health. And I realized that um, there was a lot of literature supporting this trend, and I was like, all right, I'm going to get out of this. I quit my job. I looked up online. I found an organic farm to work at, and I decided to go work on an organic farm. Now, this obviously freaked my parents out. They were like, okay, we spent all this money sending you to school, you did design, you were supposed to be a lawyer, and now you're a designer, that's fine, and now you're telling me you want to be a farmer? Are you kidding me? And um, I was like, yeah, guys, that's kind of where I'm going now, so I'm going to go live on this island here and work on this farm. And it turned out to be the best decision of my life. I'm pretty sure cutting the corporate side of my life out and going to work in nature allowed me to sort of embrace habits that helped me to help myself. And at the end of six months, my tumors reversed, my hormones balanced out, and for the first time in 15 years, the doctors told me I would be able to have babies, something that they told me was never going to be possible. And while I'm not naive enough to believe that only nature helped me do that, it was a lot of conscious, um, you know, conscious work on myself, on my body, taking care of myself, I do believe that it had a very large role to play. And so how we do that is something, you know, and so as you go forward into your lives, coming up with the obstacles that no one can see, how you creatively respond to that is something that you need to think about to be aware of. The last thing, also, you know, related to the story that comes up in permaculture is use edges and value the marginal. When I told my parents I wanted to go work on a farm, they had no idea what I was talking about. I mean, I think it took my parents about a year and a half to even today to be able to say, oh, she works in sustainability. For a while it was, she works with orphanages, she works on an organic farm, she wants to grow food. They have, it really took them a long time to get it. And that was something of valuing the marginal. I was valuing something that was not really known, that was unknown to my experiences, that my parents didn't know about, and that really helped me find my path. And marginal has different meanings. So in nature, using edges and valuing the marginal means finding, um, well, in nature, actually, edges are where two ecosystem meets. So it's where, for example, a river meets a bank. Those are two different ecosystems meeting, and that's usually where the most fertile land is, and traditionally, that's where people like to farm. In, in society, it means marginal, the marginalized people of our society are people who are often, often the furthest away from opportunities such as education, healthcare, shelter, sanitation, similar to the construction workers that Dr. Rachel was talking about. And one of the examples that has come to my mind is the example of rag pickers. You guys see it all the time. I'm sure you guys have discussed them in school. They clean up our waste system. They really help our waste management. Um, what they do is they go through our dump yards. They collect recyclable materials. They take it to a scrap yard. And they earn a living out of that. And um, they are actually an intrinsic part of our city. Without them, our city would be even more filthier than it is today, if you can imagine that. And um, the thing about them is that often they are neglected by people, by all levels of our society. No one really pays attention to them, no one really helps them out, and they're considered marginalized. But, you know, one of the things about, but the waste industry in India going forward is set to be a huge industry. In fact, a report that came out recently said that it would be around a 13 and a half billion US dollar industry by 2025. I think by that time, you guys will probably be around 25, 25 years old and up. And that's an industry that one of you could potentially get into. And to value the rag pickers, to value their knowledge, would be something that would contribute to the success of your careers going down, if that's something you're interested, for example, if that's something that you stumbled into. So valuing their knowledge could lead you to your next billion dollar idea. And that's something to think about. Um, the last thing that I really want to talk to you about is self-regulation and accepting feedback. This is a little tricky one, but in nature, it's a little easier to explain. In nature, all ecosystems are balanced. All ecosystems are self-regulated. You start with the shark. Um, in this case, we have an example of a food web where you have predators like sharks eating trouts, eating salmon, which are eating krill. And what ends up happening is if you 
unbalance this food web, the whole thing goes out of whack. If you take away the sharks, the tuna, the tuna end up overfeeding on the salmon and the krill, and the whole system falls apart. If you take away the tuna, the same thing happens on the reverse end. Both predator and prey suffer. And it's constantly self-regulated, nature responding to changes and self-regulating herself. Ourselves as human, we need to spend a little more time paying attention to how we can self-regulate ourselves. In personal relationships, this is a really good example between, you know, if you're with a friend or you're with your mom or you're with your boss, what are the things that you can do to sort of make sure that you want to be a better person with them? How can you self-regulate when you're feeling at your worst? You know, that requires a certain level of introspection, honesty, and um, vulnerability that we don't necessarily allow ourselves to feel. But how we can do that through self-regulation and accepting feedback is something that we could think about going forward. And so basically, in conclusion, what I would like to remind you is that as you're going forward in life, these five principles of permaculture, you know, using and valuing diversity, doing lots of different things, saying yes to many experiences, how that can help you, and how creatively respond, um, how self-regulating and accepting feedback, especially when you feel like you're not being your best, how that can propel you forward to grow, and not to worry so much when the unforeseen for comes up, because you have the abil ability, like nature, to change to the things going around you. And to always remember to value the mar marginal, stuff that seems weird, stuff that seems out there, stuff that seems strange. Get to know it, be fearless, grab it, grab it and learn it and you know, embrace it. And from there, I'm sure you guys will all be able to find your own voices as I found mine. Thank you very much. Thank you.